and gentlemen, Shalom. Shalom. A little stronger, Shalom. Shalom. Okay, wow. I see you guys have the, the energy from Jerusalem. It's really important to have it because I, he said I'm going to be speaking about the temple, the temple mount. I'm happy he knows what I'm going to be speaking about because usually when I start speaking, I don't know what I'm going to be speaking about. Whatever he puts in my mouth, I try to speak. If it, come out, it comes out good, it's his. If it comes out wow, lousy, it's mine. So that's the, that, that's, that's the way it is. Uh, I really pray to God that I will be able to say the right words and succeed in being a tool, an instrument to pass to you, to share with you, to inspire and be inspired by you. But before that, I want to thank you all for bringing friends of the Jewish people, friends of God, friends of the land. I know that you all have your personal interests because God said that anybody blesses us gets blessed. So I know that you all have your personal interests. But that's, we're all, that, that's the way we all are. But I'm here really to try to share with you a little about what has God has done through me in the past few years and to praise God and thank Him for all He has done by sharing His wonderful His wonderful I would say His wonderful picking me up and hugging me His wonderful accompanying me, embracing me, guiding me. And uh, this is what I'll try to share with you. And I hope, uh, I hope we succeed. If in the middle you really have any important questions, then he's speaking through you also. Raise your hand and I'll be happy to, to, to guide me along also. I'll start from, from the end. I'm, yes, I'm a member of Knesset in the Israeli, uh, in the Israeli uh, parliament. Part of God said the humor. Uh, I never really planned, I never ever had any idea that I would be developing a political career. And I really am not. I, I'm <laughs> it's pretty funny, but when I joined the Knesset, I met with the speaker of the Knesset and I told him, listen, you know, I, I, I was number 33 on the Likud list. All the polls said we were going to be reaching somewhere between 21 and 22. And so I knew I had no chance that I'd be in the Knesset and I promised my wife, don't worry, don't worry, there's no chance, my word of honor, no chance. But, you know, never believed polls and never believed husbands. Uh, Somehow, the Likud received 30 seats. And I was number 33, so I was still knew I was not in there. But one of them became an ambassador. One of them left for personal reasons. And one of them left for political reasons. And I got a phone call. Yehuda, you're, it's Thursday. On Sunday, you're a member of Knesset. And I really was not ready for that. But I, if that's what he did, I did. So when I joined the Knesset, I told him, listen, you know, it says on my door, office of member Knesset Yehuda Glick. But, you know, I'm not really here to promote Yehuda Glick. I'm here to do what I've been doing otherwhere, to do it here also. And can you please change the sign in my door and put the sign Jerusalem of Peace? And the speaker of the Knesset said, you know, we never did that in the Knesset. People have their signs with their name. This is member of parliament so and so. He said, I, I don't think you can do it. Maybe you go talk to the attorney of the Knesset. And I spoke to the attorney of the Knesset and he said, listen, we never really had anything. I said, listen, I don't know what you had or what you did have. Tell me, is there anything illegal about it? He says to me, you know, genuinely there isn't anything illegal about it. So that's going to be the sign on my door. So till this very day, my business card, my stationery, my sign on my door in, my, in the Knesset says, Office of Jerusalem of Peace. What does that mean? And here is what we have to understand. What does it mean? First of all, that's what the word Jerusalem means. Jerusalem comes from the Hebrew word 
Ir Shalom. Yerushalam. That's what it means. So if I call my office Yerushalayim Shel Shalom, it means that is what Jerusalem is all about. And that's why where King David says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And in that chapter 127, 122, I'm sorry, again and again, it repeats again using those same words. Yehi shalom bechelech. So there, be, there should be peace in your palaces. Sha'alu shalom Yerushalayim. Adabra nas shalom. The whole pap chapter is talking about shalom. And when it doesn't say shalom, it says shalva. Yishlayu ahavayich. Shalva bar menotayich. Tranquility. Peace. But what does it mean that Jerusalem is a city of peace? It can't just mean no war. Because why, if that would be the case, why would Shalom be God's name? It has to be something much deeper than that. It has to be something with a totally different understanding. And where do you look for the answers to those questions? It's in the book. They're all the answers to all the questions are in the book. It's a very wonderful book. That godly book. It's really a bestseller. It's a wonderful book. And when you read the book and you try to find out what is the opposite of Jerusalem, what is the contrast to Jerusalem, it's Babylon. Babylon is the biggest enemy of Jerusalem. But then when you study what is Babylon all about, and you read in the very beginning of the Torah, what is Babylon? We see that Babylon is a city where everybody thinks the same way, talks the same way, speaks the same language. It sounds like a beautiful thing, no? No, not at all. Those of you who are old enough to remember, we had a, a Babylon in our days. There was a country where everybody had to speak the same language. Doesn't matter if you were Lithuanian, or Belarus, Belarusian, or Russian, or Ukrainian, or it was called USSR. SSR and Bet, Bet Lamed are the same letters. Babel, Babylon, and USSR. Everybody had to speak the same language, had to think the same ideas, had to have the same statue of Lenin in every corner. That was not a happy place to be. Because if everybody has to think the same way, it means somebody is forcing them to think the, think the same way because God created us differently. When we speak about God's name as Shalom, and we look at this world and we say, who is the biggest enemy of God today in the world? It's not atheism. It's not. Why? Because atheism, atheism is one of the biggest victories of the Bible. Because if you say, I don't believe in God, it means there's one God and I don't believe in Him. In the time of the Bible, you couldn't say such a thing. The question would be, how many gods, which gods? The biggest enemy of God are those who are speaking in the name of God exclusively. And if you don't believe God my way, we have a right to kill you. In our generation, mostly, it's what we call radical Islam. When I talk out against radical Islam, I'm not talking against Islam. Vice versa. The biggest victims of the radical Islam in the past 70 years has been Muslims. 12 million Muslims have been killed by Muslims in the past 70 years. So if I talk out against radical Islam, I'm not talking against Islam. I'm talking against people who in the name of Islam are politically 
disgracing God's name. If I talk out against what the Inquisition in Spain in the 15th century, I'm not talking against Christianity. I'm talking pe against people who use Christianity politically to disgrace God's name. If I attack Jewish violence, I'm not against Judaism. I'm pro-Judaism. Because God wants us to be different. God is not exclusive. Babylon is exclusive. God is inclusive. God wants us all to be different. He wants there to be a harmony. When you play in an orchestra, not everybody has to be a drum. You want the harmony. The beauty of the drum and the violin, the piano and the harp of David. And that is the concept of Jerusalem being a city of prayer for all nations. That is the concept of the Temple Mount being a house of prayer for all nations. Not all nations have to convert. All nations have to worship God. Each and every one. God likes the uniqueness of an Indonesian prayer and a Mexican prayer and a Yemenite prayer and a French prayer and a... Even prayers from Texas are accepted. <laughs> yes, God wants us to be one big mosaic. Several different color stones all creating the beauty of God. And for that sake, God scattered us, scattered His people, His chosen people, all over the world. And I want you to understand what that means. When we read the book in the Torah, we see the biggest miracle described in the Torah. We'll be celebrating in two weeks from today the exodus from Egypt. An entire nation of slaves was taken out of Egypt, out of a cruel rule kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, what has happened here in the past century is ten times greater than what happened in the exodus from Egypt. In Egypt, we were there for 240 years, 400 years, depends which, how you learn, how you count. In the exile, we were 2,000 years. In Egypt, we were in one country. In the exile, we were in 200 countries. In Egypt is a thousand miles from here. Ethiopia is 20,000 miles from here. And God brought us all back. So we have the privilege of living today and seeing with our eyes miracles that are greater than have ever been in any time in history. As I always like to say, to be an atheist in our generation, you need a lot of faith. <laughs> and here we are, looking with our own eyes. Not only can you come to Israel today and walk in the streets of Israel and hold the Bible in your hand and walk in the footsteps of the stories that took place in the Bible, that you could have done a thousand years ago also. Today, we hold the Bible in our hand. We walk in the streets of Jerusalem. And we see with our eyes, not what happened years ago. We see the words of those prophets coming out of the book, materializing, and they are a reality. That is what we see today. That is what we are able to breathe into our lungs today. That is what we are able to recharge our spiritual batteries today. Because we see the hand of God, unless you're blind. Those of you traveling on the road from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and you're seeing those tunnels, and you're seeing those bridges, and you're seeing the roads, if you don't see Isaiah, you better buy yourself a new pair of glasses. <laughs> when Isaiah said, all the nations will come 
to Jerusalem. I'm sure those who heard him say that were saying, the guy's out of his mind. All the nations coming to Jerusalem, all the nations in the time of Isaiah were idol worshippers. Why would they want to come to Jerusalem? All the nations in the time of, of, of Isaiah couldn't come to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was a tiny little village of 150 families. All the nations couldn't come to Jerusalem because there were no airplanes, there were no trains, there were no buses, there were no bicycles. But Isaiah said, they were all the nations will be coming to Jerusalem to call in the name of the one and only God. And there's never in the history of mankind been anything greater than a nation coming back to its homeland, returning to the venues, returning to the geographical names, speaking the language. Never. Any nation that left its homeland in the history of mankind was erased from the face of the earth. Ask the Babylonians, ask the Greek, ask the Egyptians, ask the Assyrians. They're not around. There's nothing more magnificent than that. Actually, there is one thing more magnificent than that. The fact that God 4,000 years ago told us that that's what's going to happen. He said, I'm going to scatter you all around the world and eventually, wherever you will be, in all the four corners of the world, I will bring you back home. And it's happening. It's happening. Guys, in the 1980s, when we were trying to open the gates of the Soviet Union. We had people telling us, guys, you guys are out of your minds. Stop wasting your time on opening the gates of the Soviet Union. Because even if the gates open up, we can tell you as experts, as professionals who know about the Jewish community in the, Soviet, in, 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 in the former Soviet Union, we can tell you, even if the gates open up, you're not going to have more than 20,000 of them coming here. Guys, in the 1990s, we had 1.4 million immigrants from the former Soviet Union. Oh yeah, I love saying that, former Soviet Union. Former Soviet Union. Guys, that's what's happening. And we, we see it with our eyes. And every single day, he has the surprises for us. Yes, every single day we have disappointments. Every single day we have frustration. Every single day we have things that are not working the way we want them to. And we have what to complain about. But when we look back at what has happened here in the past 70 years, in the past 50 years, in the past 10 years, we are going so fast. We are climbing the mountains. We are getting there. Yes, we are. We are going to make Israel great again. <laughs> when I say we, it doesn't mean me and my team. It means we. When people ask me, what are the vessels that still need to be built for the temple? My answer is, the, one of the vessels, the most difficult vessel to build, still needs to be built. That vessel is called the hearts of mankind. Amen. Because building the temple is not going to get a million dollars and get to build another piece of real estate. Building the temple cannot even be done by leadership. It has to be done by all, every, each and every one of us. We are obliged. When will the temple be built? When we manage to pass the word around to our friends and relatives and neighbors. And that's what we have to concentrate on. Setting the world out. Because when God scattered us around the world and brought us back, He was not a tour guide. He doesn't have a tourist agency. He wanted us to bring the beauty of all the world, bring it over here, to develop it here in a concentration that can be so great. And we have to be that light to the nations. 
We have to demand from ourselves standards that no other nation demands from itself. Not in technology only, not in culture, not in education, in even every single moral step of our life. And we have to make sure our lives are built on morality, on the Word of God. We have to demand from ourselves what nobody else demands from us. Israel is not what is wrong in the Middle East, as they're trying to tell you. Israel is what is right in the Middle East. You see, person this age, 45, right? <laughs> a person like this, you can go give him a big hug because he has seen in his lifetime what no other Jew in the history of mankind has ever seen because where were we when he was born and where are we today? Look how lucky we are and look how lucky he is. What a privilege it is to be a person your age living in our generation. We, I want to remind you that 80 years ago they weren't talking about the one-state solution or two-state solution. They were talking about the final solution. And look where we are, guys. We're talking about the one-state solution. And we're talking about a solution used to bring about God's name to the world. So as I said, God has taken me in several different steps in the world. Some people have, there are some people sitting here in the crowd who have followed different steps of my life and have seen, and I never knew where I would be find myself. I was involved in the Ministry of Absorption, receiving all of those millions of Jews coming in the 1990s. I then, being the director of the Southern District of the, of the Ministry, resigned because of the Gaza, the decision to uproot Jewish settlements from Gaza. They were explaining to us, there are Jewish settlements here. They have missiles falling on them every single day. Let's take them out of here and peace will be on the world. Well, ever since the, all the Jewish communities were uprooted from Gaza, not a single missile has fallen on them. All the missiles have been coming to Israel. Because when you run away from terror, terror gets an appetite to do more. Nobody ever woke up in the morning and said, today I am a terrorist. All terrorists, like all violent people in the world, will always blame the others. The rapist will always blame the victim. She's, it's her fault. Terrorists will always blame it's the Jews' fault. We have to remember that the person to blame for violence are the violent people and those who are inciting them and those who are teaching them and we have an obligation to teach otherwise. So as for many years, for five years, I was the director of the Temple Institute and then I established the Temple Mount Heritage Foundation and I was teaching about the concept of the Terra Temple Mount, the heritage of the Temple Mount, the idea of Jerusalem of peace. And that's what I was doing from 2010 until 2016. And we had annual events dealing with the Temple. And as I'm sure you're aware, two and a half years ago, I had an event a wonderful event in the Begin Center. It was so wonderful. We had like 300 people there. We had rabbis speaking there. We had public leaders speaking there. It was a very experience of really feeling and dreaming and, and really we, were, we felt we were close as possible. At the end of the event, I walked over to the correspondent from Arut Sheva, I and the Inter Israel National News, and I said to him, look, it's such a beautiful event. I wish not only the viewers of Arut Sheva would know about this event, I wish the whole world would know about this event. Well, a half an hour later, God listened to my prayers. <laughs> and the whole world knew about it. But a week earlier, there was a terrorist attack in Jerusalem. And 
two border policemen saw the terrorist and shot him and he was critically injured and he was taken to the hospital, the terrorist. And the doctors were working on him for several hours trying to save his life. They gave him 20 quarts of blood trying to save his life. Thank God they didn't succeed and he, and he died. One of the nurses walking down that evening walked over to one of the doctors. She said to him, you know, you saw this guy was so badly injured. You saw the guy had no chance to survive. You saw the guy, you knew the guy was a terrorist. Why did you work so hard to try to save his life? And the doctor said to her, you know, that's, that's, that's the way life is. Three weeks later, the doctor comes over to her apartment in the, in the hospital and says to her, listen, a few weeks ago you asked me a question and I really didn't give you a good answer. But now I have a good answer to, to give you. I'm not a, a Jewish believer, but I, I got to tell you, a week after that event, Yehuda Glick came into the hospital in the same situation. He was critically injured. He had no chance to survive. But after that event, we sat down, all the doctors, studying what mistakes we made and what we could have done better. And Yehuda Glick came a week later. We didn't make any mistakes. Twelve quarts of blood he received. So as I'm telling you, he's been embracing me even when I had no chance. Even when point blank, four bullets went through my body and I was critically injured and my family were called to my bed for farewell. And they were told to bring a, a shirt they can tear for mourning. And that night, I went through four different kinds of surgery. The following nine days, I went through another five, including an amputation of half of my lungs, including several other inner kinds of surgery. And I want you to understand that though Israel has gone through many terror attacks, assassination attempts are not very common, thank God. But we have, we've gone through a few of them. The most famous ones are Prime Minister Rabin, late Prime Minister. We had a late minister, Rehavam Ze'evi Gandhi, Rabbi Kahana. We had many others. We had Nati Ozeri, we had Gilad Zar. None of them survived. If you, if you open your Wikipedia, there's a page called Assassination Attempt Survivors. Around the world there are like 50 of them. In Israel there's only one. And in my eyes, every time I wake up in the morning and I thank God for giving me my life, I understand that God has a mission for me. And that mission is trying to touch the hearts of mankind and connect the hearts of mankind to Jerusalem. And so when I joined the Knesset, I didn't only name my office Jerusalem of Peace. I've been actually right now, I took upon myself several different projects trying to connect with the idea of Jerusalem and peace. Dialogue in the Caucasus of dialogue between Jews and Muslims, in the caucus and dialogue between Jews and Christians, in the several different legislations dealing with dialogue among Israelis. And one of the most important covenants, one of the most important projects I'm trying to be involved in this year, I want to give Jerusalem, in honor of its 50th anniversary of reunification, a present. And what did I do? In the Knesset, there are two very important documents. One is more famous, it's called the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel. The other one is lying there right there, and it's called the Jerusalem Covenant. And the Jerusalem Covenant says, signed by the leaders of Israel, the chief rabbi, the president, the prime minister, the chairman of the Knesset, but I said to myself, 
we have to get not Jewish leaders. We have to get people from all over the world to find that covenant. We have to develop a community, the Jerusalem community, of people from all over the world. And I want to give Jerusalem a present this year. <coughs> At least a million signatures this year on this covenant. We have already almost 200,000. We want to get to many, many num more numbers. We opened a special website. It's called JerusalemofPeace.com. In JerusalemofPeace.com, you can go in there. You can sign the covenant. The covenant is already translated into Chinese, those of you who have problems in English. <laughs> it's been, and it's right now, have people signed it from A to Z. From Albania and all the way to Zimbabwe. People are signing it. And we want to ask you. I used to be a private person. Now I'm an official of Israel. I can appoint each and every one of you to be an ambassador. So now, you thought you're, you're here for some kind of ceremony I have right now. Appointing each and every one of you to be an ambassador of Jerusalem. I want you to open your cell phones or smartphones or internet, go into JerusalemAppeace.com, sign the covenant, develop your own video call for your friends, send it to an email to your friends, your relatives, your neighbors and tell them, Sign the Jerusalem Covenant. We want to give Jerusalem that present for the 50th anniversary. Yeah. It's very simple. You go into JerusalemofPeace.com. Of you can sign the covenant. And that's what I'm trying to do. If I succeed, I'll thank God. If not, then maybe... I don't, I don't want to try even thinking of what if not. Because that's what we want to do. We want to get the world surrounded, unified around Jerusalem. Because peace is not a political process. Peace is a humanitarian, a godly process. Peace does not mean destroying settlements, destructing houses. That's not peace. Peace means peace. Peace means win-win. Peace means living. Peace means building. Peace means planting trees. And peace means recognizing that God created us differently. And He wants us, each and every one of us to respect the differences between us. And Tachman is saying, okay. So, so just be my very last words. First of all, thank you all for applauding God. He deserves it. Yeah, 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 he deserved it. Thank you all for your support for the people of Israel, for the land of Israel, for the God of Israel. I want to wish each and every one of you health, satisfaction, success with all you do. For instance, one of the things just when I was on my rehabilitation, I said, well, if I can't do anything, I can't go around being a tour guide, what does God want me to do now? So that was when I published my first tour guide book about the Temple Mount. It's also been really translated to Russian, German, and Chinese as well, Ukrainian. And really, that's what I'm trying to say. Connect to God. Look at every single thing that happens to you, not as something to be disappointed for, but as something that you, God wants you to take the chance to do something else. And if God... There are no coincidences. If you met somebody coincidentally, it means God wanted you to meet him. Think what you can do. Ladies and gentlemen, coming from the light of Jerusalem, allow me to wish each and every one of you that you should be a flame in the menorah of God to bring his light to your friends, to your relatives, to your neighbors. God bless you and Shalom! shalom.